So thank you very much for um, joining us this evening. I'm just going to spend uh, a few moments talking about diabetic retinopathy. Um, the reason why I think this is an important talk is um, a uh, diabetic retinopathy is a very interesting condition. Um, it can often manifest with um, a kind of acute pathology, which requires prompt um, diagnosis on order referral, but also um, often sometimes diabetic patients um, due to their chronic um, disease condition, they can often be challenging patients and um, it's their um, health and well-being that will kind of present with acute pathology. And so, you know, it's important to be kind of aware of these patients and how best to refer them or what to refer and with what kind of time scale. So um, I'll kind of crack on with this. So um, perfect. So in the overview of the presentation, I thought we I'd discuss the pathogenesis. So I think it's important to understand um, what's really kind of going on with diabetes retinopathy at a uh, pathological um, viewpoint, because only once you understand what the underlying disease state involves, can you really understand uh, why these patients develop particular types of complications. Um, it's always important to know uh, what to refer and what kind of time scale should these patients be seen. What the kind of diagnosis you really don't want to be missed um, in the community. Um, diabetic macular edema is, is a condition which certainly from when I joined um, as eyesight training as an ophthalmologist has, has changed um, you know, massively. When I first started as a kind of training ophthalmologist, the only uh, more relative treatment available for macular edema was laser treatment. However, now we rely heavily on intravitreal based therapy. And cataract surgery um, has particular nuances in patients with di um, diabetes, and we'll, we'll kind of touch on those. So what, what's interesting, um, so if you look at diabetes as not, not just in terms of its manifestations in the eye, but whole, interestingly, um, diabetes is, you know, the most in, certainly in, in terms of a non-infective cause of mortality and morbidity worldwide. And uh, what's interesting, and this is particularly true that, as we, as we all know, we're currently going through what we describe as a kind of obesity pandemic. And so prevalence of diabetes is increasing and it's looking to increase um, decade on decade. And this is largely related to um, often poor diet. And this is particularly true, maybe not in the, in the UK, but certainly in middle income countries where, um, where affluence and disposable income is increasing. And um, the type of um, diet is often almost a kind of, uh, almost kind of Americanized type um, eating habits. We see uh, vast kind of um, endemic pandemics of kind of diabetic retinopathy. Diabetic retinopathy um, is a microvascular disease. And this microvascular disease often presents in kind of what we call end organ damage. So it's not just the eyes in patients who have diabetes they often commonly get renal problems too. I hit those glasses. Um, and diabetes does have a kind of quite a profound impact on, our, on patient population. Currently it's regarded as the second commonest cause of blindness in the working population. And as we all know, there's two types of diabetes, type one and type two, and we'll discuss how they manifest in terms of their ocular presentation. Um, I always, I always um, enjoy speaking about pathology um, simply because I think if you, if you have an understanding of what's happening to the eye at a, a disease process, you'll really kind of understand why patients present with particular clinical um, presentations. So what's interesting in, in diabetes, the, the hyperglycemic state, so the fact that these be in, in the blood, we have these high sugar concentrations circulating around. Sugar is actually very toxic. It's, it's actually, uh, uh, it's an, it has a very kind of high oxidative state. And so it causes cell damage. And in particular, as the sugar circulate between our blood vessels, they cause loss of pericytes. Now, pericytes are cells which surround our blood vessels. And these cells help to maintain the endothelium layer of blood vessel. And so parasites are important in maintaining um, blood vessel wall structure, in particular, maintaining capillary vessel wall structure. So therefore, it should come as no surprise that if you start to lose the parasite cells, you start to get damage to capillary vessel walls. And these capillary vessel walls, the type of damage that occurs, they can start forming dilatations. These dilatations can, I'm just gonna put my kind of cursor on, 
Um, is here you have this image of a blood vessel undergoing dilatation. The dilatation ends can often meet, and these can form um, aneurysm or um, saccular aneurysms, which form within the um, retinal circulation. Um, here you have um, blood vessel damage wall, which is causing dilatation of the blood vessel wall, and as, and so it's, it should come no surprise when you see when you look into a patient with diabetic retinopathy, they will have capillaries which are irregular, so often described them beaded capillary vessel walls. You'll have lots of um, aneurysms within the walls, and often because the vessel wall is compromised, um, they start to leak, and so they can leak blood, they can leak exudate, and they can leak fluid. And these all have important manifestations in the retina. And eventually what happens is as these blood vessels become compromised, there's a loss in the blood vessels. So the blood vessels start to almost die off. So the capillary uh, bed starts to die off um, due to this kind of chronic damage of the blood vessel wall. And um, as the blood vessel um, uh, blood vessels are, are lost, we get ischemia. And it's the ischemia which then starts to drive the upregulation of uh, VEGF vascular endothelial growth factor. And that may sound like a good idea that we're trying to secrete a, a, a factor which helps blood vessel growth. The reality is that these vessels that then form are not like our normal vessels. They, they're, they're vessels which tend to leak even more so. They grow into um, areas of the retina which they shouldn't do, and they can also cause extensive fibrosis. So the, the first kind of question, and uh, Victoria, if you can um, pull up a poll, uh, we just can go through a couple of questions. So in type one diabetes, uh, what percentage of patients have diabetic retinopathy um, at diagnosis? So the, so if patients being diagnosed with type one diabetes, and you look in um, the back of their eye, what percentage do you expect to have um, to have um, diabetic retinopathy changes? Perfect. Um, so, um, as always, um, great response. That's that's um, absolutely uh, well. A is the correct answer, which the vast majority um, of you um, have got there. So, um, just take that poll down. Um, yeah. So it's interesting. So um, the next question is: In type two diabetes, what percentage of patients at the point of diagnosis? have diabetic retinopathy. Uh, uh, Vic, if you could just put the poll of um, A, B, C, and D up again. Just a few more to go. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. So, the, the, yeah, there's a there's a spread of, of that, and um, I'm just going to um, take that down. And perfect. So there's one more question, and um, this is the final question, and we'll we'll go through all of these um, in a moment. So question three is uh, which of the following um, is not associated with diabetic eye disease? And um, Vicky, if you could just put the um, the poll up back again. Mm -hmm. Bit of a spread on this one as well. Yes. Okay, I'll just show you this one. Okay, shall shops stop sharing? Yes, please, please. There you go. Perfect. If it stays up on anybody's screens, just feel free to close it with the, the X. Um, so um, I'm, I'm glad that there's a bit of spread, certainly with the last two questions, because um, it's nice to know that you're not giving a talk where everyone already knows the answers. So it makes me feel like it's a waste of time. Um, so um, 
So the first question is in terms of type 1 diabetes, uh, the vast majority were absolutely spot on. So uh, with type 1 diabetes, these patients are, are, are younger patients. And at the time of presentation, uh, the vast majority, um, so it's less than you know 5% of patients have any diabetic changes. What's interesting, uh, within uh, 15 years, 90% um, of these type 1 diabetics will have diabetic retinopathy. So the type 1 diabetes, uh, the key uh, things to note is that A, when they're initially diagnosed, they will have uh, really no change in the back of the eye. So these aren't patients who are... So interesting, type 1 diabetes isn't you typically picked up by a positive retinal screen. Okay, These are patients who may are diagnosed based on other clinical manifestations of the diabetes, which may then be onward referred for diabetic screening. Um, and in the early stages of the condition, you won't see any changes in the back of their eye. Interestingly, in type two, 20% of patients will have diabetic retinopathy changes um, at the top point of diagnosis. So, what, so in this cohort of patients of type two, it's, it, it may be very uh, typical that a patient presents to for their routine um, eye screening exam. And, you know, you may um, see a few dot and blot hemorrhages um, in both eyes and the patient's then diagnosed with uh, type um, 2 diabetes. And interestingly, um, type 2 diabetes doesn't tend to kind of progress um, uh, as much as um, type 1 in terms of the retinal changes in the first 15 years. Cataracts are associated with diabetic retinopathy. And what we do know is that cataracts tend to form um, earlier and progress more so in patients with uh, diabetic retinopathy. Surprisingly, ocular surface disease is also more prevalent um, in patients with di diabetic retinopathy. And we're not, we're not completely sure why that is. Uh, there is some postulation that um, patients with diabetic um, diabetes as a whole often develop uh, nephropathy issues. So their their kind of nerve sensation or their nerve um, nerve sensation is often um, reduced, and that may be due to microvascular changes in their in, in in their in their supply to the nerves, and that may cause changes in ocular surface um, disease. So the cornea may not be as sensitive to um, dry changes in the ocular surface and therefore the tear film production is less so. So don't be surprised if patients with um, type two diabetes or type one present with more dry eye than say someone without di diabetes and uh, diabetic diagnosis. I think things which I'm sure all of you have seen and often refer to places like the eye pavilion are a vascular anomaly, so it should be, uh, you know, should come as no surprise to you that patients with diabetes also have um, other vessel diseases. So, for example, they're more likely to develop retinal vein occlusion. They're more likely to have uh, conditions such as papillitis, which I'll present later on. Um, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy is more common. And the one thing we often see is that often cranial nerve palsies, and these are isolated cranial nerve palsies. Um, so, what really um, what really defines um, whether a patient will present with uh, diabetic retinopathy and how aggressive is it likely to be? Um, one important um, correlation which we've discussed is duration. So the longer you have diabe diabetic um, a diagnosis of diabetes, the more likely you are to present with diabetic retinopathy changes. Poor blood sugar control is also correlated with um, worsening uh, diabetic retinopathy um presentation uh, and progression so if you're so if you have um you know if you have type 1 or type 2 diabetes you want your hba1c which is a measure of um general control between 6.5 and uh, 7.5 percent and this is something that um you know your gp um who um, should really kind of be hot on in terms of your diabetic um, review Pregnancy is, is an important um, risk factor. Now, patients um, with type um, with diabetes um, who are who are pregnant should be seen uh, by the hospital eye service um, within the first trimester. Um, and, and the reason being is that what we know from kind of historical and natural history data is that those patients um, who have um, an exacerbation of their diabetic retinopathy in the first trimester are likely to 
um, develop further diabetic, uh, aggressive diabetic changes as the pregnancy carries on. So typically they have a uh, screening in the first trimester. If it, if, if it appears that the diabetic retinopathy has worsened, then they have regular reviews throughout their pregnancy but otherwise it may just be a first trimester and third trimester um, and uh, for sorry, first trimester examination and then kind of postpartum, they'll have another examination. Hypertension is an important risk factor too. So patients with poor, poorly controlled blood pressure are more likely to progress to diabetic uh, retinopathy changes. It's always um, important when you see patients with um, diabetic um, retinopathy to ask them about their kidneys. We know that, um, as we said, that you know diabetes is an end organ damage. So um, patients who have diabetic changes in their eye are likely to also have similar changes going on with their kidneys. So do ask them about their um, kidney function, whether it's recently been assessed, um, whether it's currently uh, being monitored in a hospital setting. And, um, and other um, risk factors include smoking, high cholesterol, obesity, and uh, anemia are also contributors to um, uh, worsening diabetic retinopathy changes. Dr. Meha, we have a question here from somebody about the pregnancy um, qu uh, point. Um, should we be referring pregnant diabetics in their first trimester regardless or only if signs and symptoms? So, um, so they, they should be referred in the first trimester um, for it. Often what you may want to do, which we commonly see is if you just stick a, um, if, you, if you do have the ability to um, take pictures and send them in, then often that's all that's required. But um, patients who are in the first trimester of pregnancy and will have diabetes should really be seen. So um, moving on to my um, next slide, um, I'm just trying to make sure I haven't missed a slide, sorry. Um, um, what not to miss in um, diabetic retinopathy. So these are patients you may see in the community. What are the kind of key things that you, you, you really want to kind of pick up in the community and kind of potentially refer onwards? So the things that I think um, are important um, to kind of detect are a proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Um, diabetic vitreous hemorrhages are often a very common presentation and it's good to have a, an, almost an algorithm of what to do when you find them diabetic maculitis um, and also kind of tractional retinal detachments um, how to spot them, what to do with them. Um, so um, proliferative diabetic retinopathy is something that we, we should we always be looking out for when we, when we see these patients. So in terms of um, when you see a diabetic retinopathy, uh, when you see a patient with diabetes, what you're really trying to think to yourself, and um, this is normally done as part of their screening service, but it's always important to, um, you know, uh, whenever you see these patients really kind of think about, about this is where along are they in terms of their classification of diabetic retinopathy um, is there any disease visible can you see a few uh, microaneurysms in the in the peripheral parts are there a, are there a few more um, aneurysms than there may have been a couple of years ago when you saw them are there some points of exudation or is this the condition that you um, you need, really need to be kind of mindful and start to um, consider onward referral. And this is, and this, is this um, what we often call severe non proliferative diabetic retinopathy, or what's sometimes defined as pre proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And this should typically um, it should be seen um, by, um, by a hospital eye service, typically within about 13 weeks. And this often represents the hallmark where patients may be uh, switching from. Um, um, non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy into the proliferative form of the condition. And we'll talk about the kind of what you're really looking for in order to diagnose what we define as this kind of pre-proliferative state. So when I'm um, when I uh, see a patient with diabetic retinopathy, it's important to have a system, and systems are important so you don't miss um, salient findings on fundal examination. And you know. All of us will have um, different ways to examine the back of the eye. I typically 
when I examine, I'll often have a look at the um, optic nerve first, and then, then I follow the arcades, uh, superior temporal, inferior temporal, nasal, and inferior nasal. And what you're really doing is that as you're looking at the vessels, um, you're looking um, to see whether the vessels have beading um, along there, whether they're irregular, uh, whether there's hemorrhages between the um, arcades, whether there's cotton wool spots. And, and this image um, here, I'm just going to put my cursor on, you can see the, the occasional um, blot hemorrhages there. Um, there's potentially a kind of micro aneurysm formation. And here you can, uh, you can see what I would define as a, a cotton wool spot. Often this is referred to as a soft exudate. And um, soft exudates, um, what are they? So interestingly, they're, they're, they're not exudation. Um, this is, um, this um, cotton wool spot is um, what we call um, axomplasmic. Um, so it's within the nerve fibre layer. It's an accumulation of um, axomplasmic flow, which um, doesn't flow through the um, neurons or the ganglion cell layers. And that's typically due to focal points of ischemia around that area due to microvascular disease. Just got a question for you, sorry to interrupt. Should, no. um, should moderate NPDR be referred? Um, sorry, a non periphery diabetes retinopathy. You see, yeah, so I'm, I'm just going to, um, I've got a slide kind of later on, and we'll talk about what needs to kind of really be referred and what, okay. when you're looking at that, um, what you want to refer. Thanks. So uh, early changes um, are kind of represented here. So often we have these, um, we have the vessels look very kind of beaded. You have these loop formations forming. And, um, and in this image here, we can almost see kind of a, a kind of early Irma formation. So these are interretinal microvascular anomalies. These often are connections that you can start to see forming between the arterial and venous circulation. And these often look as if um, what's happening is that these are new vessels, but these are actually Irma. And this often represents new vessels or vessels growing from um, the veins to the arteries. And these are actually um, kind of collateral vessels forming as the um, as, as you start to get uh, venous um, damage and none of these so none of these changes require referral so early vessel changes in diabetes retinopathy such as looping venous bead, ble, um, beading the occasional exudate here and there does not require um, referral um, and often um, in these patients you'll start to see um, microaneurysm formations which once again um, here, 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 do not require referral. Um, interesting for those um, of, of you who have OCT examinations, when you do an OCT, what you may find in these patients, you can find this slight kind of hyper-reflective uh, foci. So I'm just popping a cursor over here, 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 here. And interestingly, what the OCT there is picking up are, um, are microaneurysms within the retina. In this image, you have micro, multiple microaneurysms, and you also have lots of um, cystoid maculoedema or diabetic maculoedema in, in, in relation to that. And that's a that's a orange flag, so that needs a definite referral to the hospitalised service. If you have microaneurysms without any evidence of um, uh, diabetic maculoedema, it certainly does not need referring. Um, we can often um, in these patients, we will often find areas of um, exudation. Uh, exudation really forms as the vessels become leaky, they leak out um, lipids, which are normally carried the patient. And as these lipids um, accumulate within the retina, they um, typically um, accumulate in the outer plexiform layer. Um, so unlike cotton wool spots, which uh, and this is another way of um, differentiating between cotton wool spots versus exudation, so um, those of us who, who you say like a, a, a 90 degree volk angle and um, a 90 degree volk lens to examine the retina, the cotton wool spots are actually much more superficial on the retina, whereas the exudation certainly lie much deeper in the retina. And you can often get a, a, an idea by kind of focusing on the, on the uh, retinal surface where, where these changes are. So exudation actually lies on the um, outer plexiform layer so it's much closer to the photoreceptors and th these are much deeper. And once again, exudates um, by themselves do not require 
um, an uh, if you do find that there's lots of exudation with um, other um, features such as um, cyst, uh, diabetic macular edema, then that does need to be referred, but isolated points of exudation does not require urgent referral or referral to hospitalized service. Um, this slide, um, often, I'm, often, I'm often asked what exactly is IRMA, and this slide tries to kind of represent um, IRMA. So IRMA is interretinal microvascular anomalies, and these often um, pose as uh, vascular, um, vascular communication between the arterial and venous circulation. And, um, and here, here you, can, you, can, you can see these kind of changes happening. So you can see these vessels forming between them. And these aren't new vessels. So what's important about these, these, these um, tributary vessels lie within the retina. They don't grow above the retina and they're slightly more organized than new vessel formation otherwise. And um, this is a feature of um, pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So if you do see ermas, um, what you what you want to do is, is to kind of um, if you, if you so I'm just going to show you the next slide so it gives more context. So this is um, the the kind of pre proliferative diabetic retinopathy which does require referral to the eye service, and this often follows this kind of simple rule of four two one. Okay, and so when you're looking at these patients with diabetic retinopathy, the questions that you're really asking are first of all, do they have blot and dot hemorrhage in all four quadrants, okay? And this may be uh, dot and blot hemorrhages plus minus uh, microaneurysms. So they're scattered within, throughout all four quadrants of the retina. Second question you want to ask yourself, is there venous be um, beading within at least two quadrants of the, of the retina? And, um, and you know, um, venous beading, uh, I'm just going to, so if you, if you look here, you can just see the kind of irregularity of, of the uh, retinal vein as it comes down there. You can see these loop formations. You can see these multiple blot and dot hemorrhages throughout all quadrants. Okay. Um, and then what you want to look at is, is that, is there IRMA? So these are, as described, kind of communications between the retinal and venous circulation. So you can often see these kind of abnormal kind of vessels forming around these areas, these areas. And if you are seeing those, then uh, you, you, this patient needs to be reviewed, reviewed by the hospitalized service, um, ideally within um, 13 weeks. Okay, because this is almost kind of preemptive findings before we start to get new vessel formation. And in this image, this is actually new vessel formation on the disc. And you can see this, all these new vessels forming here. But these features often represent the, um, the kind of preceding changes. So here I've got some more um, retinal uh, fundus images, which once again try to demonstrate this kind of four to one rule. So if you look at this right um, fundus uh, photograph, you can clearly see that, um, and this is um, uh, this is centered um, on the uh, on the central macula, and you also have an image centered on the optic disc. And what's quite um, you know quite apparent on these images that this patient has clearly has dot and blot hemorrhages in all four quadrants. Um, if you look at the if you follow the retinal veins um, in this, you, you can classically see all the kind of uh, venous beading that we often talk about, the irregularity of the vessel contour. Um, you'll be able to see microaneurysms forming within these, and you can see areas of exudation. So these are all kind of exudate-like deposits here. Um, things like this, just on this image, just on the disc center. So that's a classical cotton wool, cotton wool spot. So cotton wool spots are more fluffy edged, and that's why they're often called soft exudate, and they're more superficial. So what's interesting here, remember how I was saying that this is really um, axomplasmic flow, so it occurs in the uh, nerve fiber layer, and it's quite nicely demonstrated here. You can see how the, um, the this cotton wool spot or soft exudate is masking, almost masking the vessel underneath it. So that gives you an idea that this lies superficial to the vessel within the nerve fiber layer of the retina, whereas often exudates are much deeper um, within the retinal layers. And you can see there, the more, more kind of, the, the edges are more well-defined. Um, and um, if, you, if you, so then, and so you, you've identified uh, blot dot hemorrhages in all four quadrants, you identified there's more than two quadrants of uh, uh, venous beading, 
And then what you're trying to look at is what, what we call kind of um, irregularities between the kind of arterial venous circulation. And, you know, the important thing about diabetic retinopathy, it does require careful observation. And I'm actually looking at this picture to see whether I can find any um, kind of um, uh, So I can't find any, I can't see any Irma, but you know, I would, if I was in a community, uh, if I was a community optometrist and a patient presented with fundus features such as this, and you took a history, you asked them what the diabetes retinopathy control is, and they may admit, look, they haven't really uh, been behaving themselves, their sugars have been uh, slightly, um, poor, well, have been poorly controlled, they've started being picked up with early uh, renal problems, then the this is exactly the type of patient that is required on referral. Um, I've got some uh, more images which kind of show um, cotton wool spots versus exudate. So if you look at the picture of the fundus uh, photograph just on the right, I'm just going to put my cursor back up. So once again, here you can see these kind of fluffy um, or soft exudates, which are um, cotton wool spots there. Uh, the exudates are certainly much more deeper, more well defined within the retina. Okay. It's always um, important to remember um, not everything's diabetic retinopathy. And um, sometimes it's very easy um, to differentiate the two. And that's because um, patients always have a fellow eye. So never forget to examine what the status of the fellow eye is. Diabetic retinopathy is a systemic disease, and therefore what you see in one eye should largely be mirrored by similar changes in the fellow eye. So where you develop, where you find these unilateral changes, it's, it's not uh, diabetic retinopathy. So what else can it be? So if you have unilateral changes, so one eye has lots of um, venous irregularities, lots of dot blot hemorrhages, then what you're trying to, then usually the, the commonest cause for that is a, a vein occlusion. And here um, on the right, I have what a central retinal vein occlusion looks like. You can see the uh, very tortuous veins, the, the kind of blot hemorrhages within there. You can see cotton wool spots um, located. And the image on the far right has a branch retinal uh, vein occlusion. And like, you can see that from the distribution. And if you look at the central macula there, it's most likely that they've also have some um, macular edema developing due to the um, branch uh, vein occlusion. This image um, on the far left <clears throat> is a different pathology. And if I was to say um, there's similar findings in the fellow eye, um, would anyone like to have a guess what's going on in this eye or you know, in this patient? Happy for anyone to kind of um, give me an answer. Yeah, um, vasculitis. Yeah, um, so a hyper hypertension. So that, that someone's just um, popped that on there. So think about hypertensive retinopathy, and um, vasculitis is another. So these patients, if they if they kind of present with um, so hypertensive retinopathy. Um, what patient may present with typically is, is a headache. Okay, so it may be a headache, reduction in vision, and they're presented to the clinic. Um, um, and obviously, you know, take a blood pressure, and that's your kind of diagnosis. Um, if it's vasculitis, then what you're really looking at, you're looking at other markers of inflammatory change in the eye. So when you're looking into the eye, have a look to see whether there's any anterior chamber activity, whether there's any flare in cells present there. Are there a synechiae? And as you're looking um, um, towards the back, they'll often, if you try and look into the back of the eye, they often have vitritis going on. So when you look into the back of the eye, the vessels or the, the fundus is, is very kind of hazy looking. And that's because they have, vitri they have cells in the vitreous and that's called vitritis. So when you look into the back of the eye, um, everything is really poorly defined. And, um, and, and so that's vasculitis. Here, when you look into the back of the eye, you know, everything, is very clear and well defined. What, but what you're seeing are these kind of dot and blot hemorrhages when you look in the other eye, similar dot and blot hemorrhages. 
you're seeing cotton wool spots. And what, well, then what you're really trying to look for um, in, the, in the vessels, and this is particularly something which you, when you're looking a bit more kind of far out, is you're looking for what we def define as kind of AV nipping. And this is a really good example in this corner, just here where I'm putting my cursor over. So you can see the arterial, so the arterial retinal artery crossing the vein and the veins completely uh, crossed over at its crossover point there. And um, this is, and then you also start to have exudation at the center. And this is a, an urgent, urgent, urgent referral to the eye clinic um, for this. Um, central retinal vein occlusion generally do not require, um, so they need to be referred, but they don't need to be kind of seen on the same day, unlike hypertensive retinopathy changes um, there. It's not uncommon um, to have uh, papillitis or papillopathy developing in diabetics. Um, so once again, these are patients who Type 1 diabetics who have very kind of poor control and they kind of classically come into the um, often, I mean, I, I still even see at the eye hospital now that they're type 1 diabetics and they typically have a, a bottle of iron brew or um, coke in their hands. And, and you can clearly tell that, um, you know, they're not really kind of maintaining good, um, good kind of blood glucose control. And um, so when you first look into the eye, it's a moment of kind of shock horror. You think, oh, they have, um, they've got a swollen disc and therefore need an urgent referral. And one way to kind of, um, what, what's different in terms of diabetic pap uh, papillitis or papillopathy is these are often incidental findings. So you may look into the back of the eye and the patient in themselves has, has no problem, okay? So these are kind of incidental kind of swollen um, or what looks like swollen discs in patients with diabetes. They're very hyperemic. So you can just see how the vessels are really engorged. If you, if you measure the vision, it's often normal, measure their color vision, absolutely normal. They have no um, relative afferent pupillary defects in either eye. And, and often this, this, once their blood sugar level control improves, so too does this um, papillopathy. And this, often, and this is a kind of red flag thing that you really do need to kind of uh, refer onwards to be seen in the hospital eye service. The thing not to miss um, and <clears throat> it is um, new vessel formation. And it cannot be stressed enough just how easy it is to um, miss the new vessel formation. Okay. Um, often when we see images that people present, you, you kind of see them all magnified and they're kind of taken out sections as I have done here. And you think, you know, how on earth can you miss these? But um, if you speak to kind of ophthalmologists who have, you know, who have kind of been in hospitals for many years, I will reassure you, we often miss new vessel formations on, uh, you know, it, it does happen. And um, the one thing which um, is really interesting is that, um, um, as, as you know, um, many of us, both in the community and in, the, in, in, in say, the eye pavilion, we have access to Optos um, imaging. And what you can often do with these patients at the point of um, detecting new vessels, in a patient, if you just look at some of their optos pictures and say if they've been taken two or three months earlier, and you look at this point that now has you've identified as new vessel formation, it's not uncommon that if you look back, say maybe two, three months earlier, that there was some hint or some evidence of new vessel formation at that moment in time. So the kind of take home message here is, um, don't be disappointed if you don't pick up new vessels. Okay, it is something that is missed, certainly if it is very subtle. But with the same, on the same note, you know, it's one of these things that unless you're really thinking about it and unless you're really trying to look for it, they will get missed. So, and it goes back to the point of, you know, when you're doing a fundus examination, always have the system. Okay, it doesn't matter which order you, you follow in. I personally, like I said, um, I do the disc the arcades, uh, peripheral retina, and then I go on to the macula. But when you're looking at the vessels and you're following them out into the periphery, you're constantly, you're constantly asking yourself, can I see any evidence of new vessel formation? And once again, um, it's a red flag. It needs to be referred um, ASAP um, to the um, hospitalized service. Um, 
And um, yeah, so these are all kind of images where you can see these kind of vessel formation. You know, sometimes as in the picture on the left, um, you may look at the uh, fundus and, you know, you know, honestly, there's not a huge amount of dot and blot hemorrhages, you know, it doesn't look like an angry retina, but yet clearly here you see this whole uh, from of a new vessel formation, which largely should not be missed and should be kind of picked up. Um, um, here, here, here you can see these um, dot and blot hemorrhages, the fundus certainly looks a lot more angry, and if you look on the disc here, you can see the new vessel formation here. Um, here, um, you know, uh, one may argue, is this kind of early Irma? Are you getting kind of venous arterial communications here? And if you do see these type of uh, vessels, which you're not sure whether these are new vessels or whether they're Irma, it's always best to kind of err on the side of caution and, and um, kind of refer on. And here, once again, what's beautifully illustrated here is this kind of venous beading that you can see um, on the back of the fundus there. Okay. Um, this is neovascular glaucoma, and it does happen in patients with um, diabetic retinopathy. And I always say if a patient has unfortunately um, gone on to de um, develop or presents with neovascular glaucoma, that is really a failure in the screening service. And we've really, um, you know, in many ways, kind of, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a failure of the system. And that may be due to various things. But um, once they've really got to this state, the eye, um, there's very little we can really offer. Um, for the patients and the visual potential often is just simply making the eye comfortable. And why do patients get neovascular glaucoma? Well, in these patients, the, the kind of vascular endothelial growth uh, factor secretion is now so high that these diffusible factors, which would normally diffuse within the posterior segment of the eye, have now entered um, into the anterior segment and often cause neovascularization there. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a kind of end stage and quite a poor prognosis for an eye if they start to get um, What things can we look at where we, we, we kind of think that this patient needs to become really referred in quite urgently for, um, for hospital eye service um, review? So these are what I kind of coin as the kind of advanced diabetic retinopathy diseases. So often these patients will present with uh, vitreous hemorrhages where you get new vessel formation. This image on the um, on the right here, here you can see new vessels forming there and these new vessels start to then grow into the vitreous and start causing traction. So here you can see what we def uh, what I would describe as um, a fibrovascular membrane and the the real issue here is that when these new vessels start to grow, the new vessels start to grow into the vitreous and they almost start to form a, a layer of um, or almost a mesh of uh, new vessels. Which what I define as a kind of fibrovascular membrane here. And the problem with the fibrovascular membrane is that these um, membranes then start to contract. And as they contract, they can cause what we define as tractional diabetic retinopathy. And um, that once again is, is a very kind of poor prognosis for, for uh, a patient's eye. Um, so when, um, so as many of you know, um, I both kind of do cataract and vitretinal surgery. When would I consider doing a, a vitrectomy on patients with um, diabetic eye disease? So one of the common um, um, scenarios where I do uh, a vitrectomy, safe patients develop um, a diabetic vitreous hemorrhage. Now, typically what I tend to do is um, if, if the vitreous hemorrhage is relatively isolated and the patient has generally good vision and they've already had good um, panretinal photocoagulation, I tend to observe it. And I usually observe for somewhere between two to three months um, or actually about one to, one to two months I observe. And usually one of two things happen. Either the vitreous hemorrhage will start to spontaneously clear and the patient's vision starts to return to normal, or it doesn't. And if at, say, month two, um, the vitreous hemorrhage is still persistent, the vision is still poor, at month three, I tend to kind of go in and clear out all the vitreous gel. And I do really kind of good endolaser um, PRP. So that's lasering the peripheral retina, but with a laser actually inside the eye so you can get much further out into the retina. 
And so, um, so I call those um, non-resolving diabetic vitreous hemorrhages or persistent diabetic vitreous hemorrhages. I tend to have a low threshold to do a vitrectomy on. Um, and, and the vitrectomy has has um, has a, a lot of you know a, quite a lot of beneficial um, roles. So what we do know is that often if they've had a vitrectomy, you've removed the vitreous scaffold for which new vessels can grow into. So what tends not to happen is as is kind of illustrated on this image on the um, right. Um, so here you can see near vascularization these new vessels have grown into the vitreous, they form this fibrovascular complexes. And I'm just going to kind of show the kind of edges of this. So all this edge of this kind of fibrovascular membrane, which forms in the back of the eye. And the problem with this fibrovascular membrane is as you can just see at the top, um, you start to get contraction of this fibrovascular membrane. And as it contracts, it in essence, rips the retina off the back of the eye. So you know, when patients um, develop these type of complications, um, you know, it, you know, I, I often think it's really a kind of failure of the system uh, because what a diabetic screening service is designed to do is to prevent patients from progressing to, to this state of um, the diabetic retinopathy. This is another um, common um, indication for uh, vitrectomy, which I perform surgery on for. So often uh, patients with... Um, diabetic maculodema can also um, develop these kind of ERMs so as epiretinal membrane. I'm just going to put the cursor back on here. So here you can clearly see these kind of cystic accumulations here. Okay. And so if they weren't a diet, if they weren't a diabetic and you saw them, then this would um, say just be cystoid maculodema. But because this is in the context of a diabetic patient, it's called diabetic maculodema. On the surface, they have this um, hyperreflective signal membrane just on the surface, and that's an ERM. So, I did give a talk um, some months ago where I spoke about ERMs. So, ERMs, um, the most commonest cause for an ERM is the separation of the vitreous when they get PVD, but any condition which causes inflammation in the retina can cause an ERM. So, it's often not uncommon in patients who are diabetics where they have. Uh, diabetic macular edema, they also have um, coexisting epiretinal membranes. And often in these patients, simply injecting um, anti-VEGF uh, agents or Osidex does not fix this cystoid macular edema, because often the cystoid macular edema is um, a result of both these leaky vessels, but also traction being applied from the epiretinal membrane. So I tend in these patients to do a vitrectomy, remove the vitreous gel, peel away the epiretinal membrane, and also give an injection of a anti-VEGF, uh, anti such as ILEA at the end of the case. Um, moving on to kind of diabetic macular edema. <clears throat> this, is, this is probably uh, um, everything I spoke up until to about this point. Um, we've been managing diabetic retinopathy in terms of proliferative and diabetic retinopathy, largely you know, it's been largely unchanged for the last um, 50 years. So patients with uh, new vessel formation, patients with um, proliferative diabetic retinopathy come into the hospitalized service and undergo panretinal photocoagulation. What does the panretinal photocoagulation do? I often tell patients, <clears throat> in essence, what we're doing is we're firing, layer, we're firing laser in areas of ischemic retina which the aim of which is to, in essence, kind of destroy that ischemic retina. And the analogy often is, you know, think of your, your, your foot, you have a gangrene in the foot, and what the surgeon does is that he chops away that gangrenous um, um, tissue in order to save the rest of the, um, the rest of the limb. And PRP in many ways isn't any different to that. So what you're doing with the laser, you're destroying peripheral ischemic retina in order to salvage the central macula, okay? And, and so PRP hasn't changed, but what has undergone uh, a, a, you know, a significant um, a change in the way in which manage the, uh, manages condition is diabetic macular edema. So when I first started um, uh, as an ophthalmologist, as a trainee ophthalmologist, when patients presented with diabetic macular edema, they received um, laser treatment to the macula. And as you can imagine, laser treatment to the macula is, isn't, wasn't like, you know, the, 
you know, it, it was it was quite a challenging treatment to apply because often you could um, apply laser, it could be applied uh, quite heavily, and therefore the patients would have these kind of central scotomas in their vision. Okay, um, but we now, you know, now um, you know, uh, macular laser has largely kind of died off. No one really kind of performs macular um, lasers as, as they used to do before. And that's because uh, we have um, we have drugs which we kind of inject into the eye, and I'll speak about those um, shortly. So, what is um, DMO, diabetic macular edema? In essence, it's just an accumulation of fluid within the retina, and this accumulates because the, as I said, the vessel walls become compromised, they become leaky, and then you um, leak out fluid, you leak out exudate, and this manifests um, in, in, in the retina. And interestingly. Um, diabetic macular edema is, 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 you know, is, one the, uh, is actually one of the leading causes for registration of blindness amongst the kind of working population. Well, interesting, it was the leading cause of blindness amongst the working population. But now that we have all these drugs, interestingly, um, and this kind of really kind of shows how much, um, how the landscape of um, treating um, retinal conditions has changed. Now, the number one cause of uh, blindness within the working population is actually inherited retinal disease. And now the second commonest is uh, diabetic macular edema or diabetic disease. And that's largely happened simply because we have these new treatments. When I talk about new treatments, we're talking about anti-VEGF agents and also uh, intravitreal steroid implants such as Osudex and um, Illuvian. Not all types of diabetic macular edema are, um, are um, approved for intravitreal in, um, therapy. So in order for a patient to qualify for treatment of say anti-VEGF um, agents, what they need is they need greater than, I'm just gonna put my, so they need greater than 400 microns of thickness within what they define as a central subfield. Uh, what I mean by that is this, um, this um, slide quite nicely demonstrates that. So, um, you know, it's often called center involving DMO. So this is the um, EDTRS uh, macular grid, which comes on some of the OCT machines that you may or may not have. Um, and in the clinic, what we're looking for is, um, I'm just gonna put the cursor on, if the swelling falls within the central subfield, which is one millimeter across, um, and the thickness is greater than 400 microns, the patient, the, you know, the patient gets um, intravitreal injections. If the, you know, if, if the swelling falls outside of the central grid, then say in this case, um, it's, you know, the clinician may decide, um, you know, it doesn't warrant treatment. Personally, if I, if I had a patient who's dropped vision, has that type of finding, I would probably err on the side of caution to give them a bit of treatment. Whereas if they had if this was the only area of thickness, um, I certainly uh, wouldn't give them any kind of intravitreal injection. And so if you do have patients with uh, diabetic macular edema, um, it, you know, it's always important if you, if you have an OCT to kind of comment on what the central subfield is, because that helps us to kind of triage these patients. And so these patients do need kind of urgent kind of uh, onward referral to the hospitalized service. Um, and, and these are kind of um, images of um, OCT images of um, diabetic macular edema. Once again, um, you may recall I was talking about um, on the OCT. The OCT is it's a fantastic device. And I'm just going to pull my cursor up. On here, you can see these small kind of hyperreflective little blobs, and those are small microaneurysm, um, which are kind of formed within the retina. Um, you can see the cystic accumulations, the exudation um, here causes um, a masking um, of the underlying retina. So you, you get this kind of feature developing. Um, it's not too uncommon that sometimes when you, you have this um, cysted um, diabetic macular edema, and you have this intraretinal cyst, but you can often get this kind of subretinal fluid accumulating there as well. And both of this, whether it's intraretinal, subretinal, uh, responds really well to um, intravitreal um, anti-VEGF agents. Um, so there, there is another type of uh, macular edema, which we can't often define as diffuse macular edema. And um, 
this diffuse uh, type of macrodemia doesn't really respond to um, anti-VEGF agents. And often um, diffuse macrodemia, as the name suggests, involves a thickening of the entire macula rather than a, a small focal point. And this often results from um, 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 macular um, ischemia. So I'm just going to pull up the cursor again. So this is a um, an, uh, so this is a kind of color furnace photograph. You can central macula there. <clears throat> the foveal kind of reflectance is really kind of nullified, so it looks really kind of dull. So if you look at the macula, it looks like a dull. It has almost kind of what they describe featureless appearance of the central macula there. If you were to do a uh, fundus fluorescein angiogram, um, and this is what we call kind of diffuse um, hyperreflectance. So if you look all across the macula, you're getting lots of leak throughout there. And if you look at the earlier pictures, you, you can see just here. So everyone has what we call a foveal avascular zone. So the central part of your fovea, um, it does not have a capillary network. But what you can see is that that foveal avascular zone is enlarged. You get areas around here of ischemia and dropout. And these patients have what the diffuse diabetic macular edema. So once again, do refer them on. However, um, there's really not a lot we can often do for these patients because the, the pathology really isn't leak, it's more loss of the capillary bed. Um, I think I've spoken about this slide already. Um, another um, important presentation that you'll quite commonly see in practice, so a patient with non uh, type 2 diabetes suddenly wakes up and they've you know, got a complete kind of loss of vision. And most commonly, um, this is due to a, a diabetic vitreous hemorrhage. These are very common. Why do they occur? Well, you know, I often, you know, often say to trainees that if you are detecting, if, if you do diagnose a patient with um, a diabetic vitreous hemorrhage, think why that hemorrhage has happened. And most commonly why these happen is because they're starting to develop some early neovascularization. These vessels are very fragile and these vessels have been ruptured and cause bleeding. So um, if they, if say if in this color fence photograph, the images as such, you're not gonna be able to find a new vessel. However, importantly, do look at the fellow eye. Do they have pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy? You know, is this an idea of, does this give you a clue actually what's happened in the eye, which has had the acute vitreous hemorrhage? Okay, and, that, and that, that's really the way to kind of think about these. Um, when I see a patient with a, um, a diabetic vitreous hemorrhage, there's um, certain things that I really want to know. Um, I want to know whether they've had uh, previous uh, panretinal photocoagulation. Okay, that's, that's really important. Um, and, and then the type of things I'd want to do is I'd, I'd often do a, an ultrasound examination just to make sure that the retina is attached. Because what you, what you don't want to do in these patients um, there's a couple, you don't want to miss an underlying retinal tear. So do look for other, um, you know, after saying a, 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 a vitreous hemorrhage in a diabetic is not always related to their diabetes. And, and so, you know, think, has this patient uh, developed a retinal tear, a retinal detachment? So, you know, once again, do, are they a high myope? Um, what does the fellow eye look like? Does the fellow eye have lots of peripheral digit, uh, marpic degeneration? Do they have lots of lattice? Had they previously had a retinal tear in the other eye? And you know that that's that's important when um, when referring a case on. So when when do I um, when am I when am I when when in a case of uh, diabetic vitreous hemorrhage when do I relax and when do I get slightly kind of twitchy and anxious? So if a patient um, presents with a diabetic vitreous hemorrhage and they have previously had lots of panretina photocoagulation, then I tend to relax. The reason being is that I know that they've, you know, I often describe PRP as almost spot wild in the retina and the periphery. I know that, um, you know, they're unlikely to have a underlying retinal tear detachment because the retina's um, been um, stapled down with the PRP. And in these patients, I, I tend to be more conservative in my management. If it's a if it's a young patient who has a uh, who has um, a vitreous hemorrhage um, in someone who's relatively poorly compliant, the fellow eye um, suggests um, quite um, advanced diabetic changes. 
then what I really don't want to do is to just um, simply observe the diabetic vitreous hemorrhage. Um, and the reason being is that it's most likely that the diabetic vitreous hemorrhage in their eye in this young patient is due to new vessel formation. And um, if you simply observe for many months, what's going to happen is that these new vessels are going to grow, they're going to form the fibrovascular membranes, and then of course, potentially attractional diabetes neuropathy um, detachment. And so I personally, um, I'm more aggressive in these uh, poorly controlled patients with um, diabetic, diabetic vitreous hemorrhage. Okay. Finally, um, on to cataracts, and I thought I'd talk about cataracts and diabetic eye disease because, you know, these two things are quite common, okay? Um, there's lots of patients with um, diabetic eye disease and there's lots of these patients who also have cataracts. So what we know um, is that cataracts tend to develop earlier in patients with um, diabetes, particularly if it's poorly controlled. We also know that um, often if you have diabetes, you may develop things like um, diabetic macular edema for which you may require intravitreal injections. And if you have lots and lots of intravitreal injections, then you are, then it is associated with higher complication rates when the uh, cataracts are performed. So you have a higher, what we call a PCR rupture rate in patients uh, with lots of, kind of intravitreal injections. Okay. We know that um, in, um, di in diabetic eye disease, um, there's increased inflammation, um, often following cataract surgery, and therefore you have a compromise of the blood retinal barrier. So the incidence of developing um, systole macular edema in patients with diabetes, diabetic patients who have cataract surgery is much higher. Interestingly, um, patients uh, with diabetes also um, tend not to dilate uh, um, as well as patients um, without, and that uh, maybe due to um, uh, kind of neural issues uh, or, um, uh, or kind of ischemia within the iris um, itself. Okay. And um, we also know that patients who um, have um, cataract surgery in, in, in poorly controlled diabetics, you can often get a worsening of the diabetic retinopathy post cataract surgery. So what are the kind of key things we need to kind of think about um, in, in this cohort of patients? So I broadly descri uh, describe this as kind of preoperative considerations, postoperative and complications. Okay, so preoperatively, if, we, if you have a patient with severe pre proliferative diabetic retinopathy, um, do not prioritize the cataract. What they need is good uh, panretinal photocoagulation uh, prior to the cataract surgery. Otherwise, the cataract surgery can often um, tip them from a pre proliferative state into a proliferative state quite easily. Uh, any diabetic macular edema also equally needs to be treated and managed prior to any cataract surgery. And, um, and um, but consider kind of optimizing the ocular surface. Conditions like blepharitis and ocular surface disease are more common in, in this cohort of patients. So try and optimize those before you do, before you do a cataract. Postoperatively, we typically put these patients on uh, acular and extended course of topical steroids as well. And this helps to reduce the um, incidence of uh, postoperative system macular edema. Complications which um, can um, occur in these patients, you can often get a fibrinous anterior uveitis. Um, you can, uh, PCL rates often um, are slightly higher in these patients. You can get a, a progression in the diabetic retinopathy, also in DMO. And as, as mentioned before, the PC rupture rate is higher in these patients due to often uh, the multiple intravitreal injections. So that's the... Um, that's the kind of diabetic talk, and, and um, sorry if I've kind of gone on. Um, that's why what I didn't really want to do was to kind of talk about macular holds. I think it's important um, we kind of tackle one subject at a time, but I will be giving a talk on full thick macular holds, and I'll be presenting um, some of the data that I've, uh, I, I'm kind of working on in here in Edinburgh. So um, having um, uh, trained in more fields and spent many years there doing VR surgery, one of the things that um, uh, you know, one of the things that I do here is I actually do not posture macular holes after surgery. And there's some interesting data that I'm generating also being here in Edinburgh, which kind of you know shows that actually you know um, face down posturing makes no difference for macular hole closure. So next time I'll um, I'll talk about full fixed macular holes, how to diagnose them, um, 
other conditions which may look like full fixed macular holes, which they aren't. Uh, we'll talk about the surgery and face down posturing. Um, thank you very much. And um, I'll kind of hand over and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll just um, leave it open for some questions for a few minutes. Feel free to take yourselves off mute um, or you can type in the chat box if it's easier. I'll just take this opportunity while you're typing or getting ready to talk to say that I'll um, send out your feedback forms. If you could complete them just by returning and sending back to me, then I can issue you with a certificate of attendance. The talk has also been recorded. So if anybody would like to watch it again or, or share it with, with one of their colleagues, um, then you're very welcome to do so. Just feel free to request that from me. Um, so do we have any questions or anyone want to take themselves off mute? I think you have answered everything, Dr. Mayhat. So nobody mm -hmm. needs to ask anything at all. Um, okay, oh, here we go. We've got a question. Hemorrhages and or hard exudates in close proximity to the fovea, no macular edema, do they need referred? Uh, no. No. So, um, yeah, so um, because largely there's nothing we can really offer. Okay, thank you. They have a, um, um, yeah, yeah. What's the difference between pre-retinal hem hemorrhages and vitreous hemorrhage? Oh, great question. Um, so uh, a vitreous hemorrhage, so uh, I think I was hope to try and get a picture. Can I, can I get a picture up? So, I think uh, you can. You just need to share uh, your screen again. If I go share screen, can I go up to... Um, So this, um, if I, so this image here is what we call a pre-retinal hemorrhage. Okay, so um, so what you can probably appreciate, you see how the hemorrhage is really well defined, and you can see the edges of the uh, hemorrhage, um, and the hemorrhage here is what we often kind of describe as a. So the hemorrhage here lies between the retina and the posterior hyaloid, okay? So, um, so the hemorrhage has, so it's bled from the retinal blood vessels. It's, uh, it's sitting just between the posterior hyaloid, so just the, the back end of the vitreous, okay? But yet the blood hasn't seeped into the central vitreous, okay? So this is what we call a, a pre-retinal um, hemorrhage. And you can, you can tell it's often pre-retinal hemorrhage because it's often well confined. So it often has these kind of hard kind of boundaries here. OK, and uh, what's usually happened in this case is that you've you um, you get these new vessels kind of growing in. You get focal areas of uh, posterior vitreous detachment. So it's not complete vitreous detachment, but uh, focal areas of separation of the vitreous from the retina. And as that separation occurs, you get pulling and you get this bleed forming within this kind of pre retinal space. So it's between the uh, posterior hyaloid and the retina, okay, so that's called a pre-retinal hemorrhage. And in, importantly, when you look into these eyes, you, you can see clearly, you can see all the peripheral retina and you can see these well-defined uh, retinal bleeds. Whereas when you look at a, a vitreous hemorrhage, it usually looks, um, da, 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 da. vitreous hemorrhage here, the kind of blood's clearly broken in to the, um, into the kind of vitreous and you get this kind of haze. Once again, here, this haze, Whereas if you look on this image here, this is a pre-retinal hemorrhage. I mean, once again, we know it's pre-retinal. It's well confined within the areas of the posterior hyaloid separation and the blood forms there. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and I hope. Um, I think that is all the questions now. So um, thank you very much. That was great.